today we're going to in this session is uh, uh, it's not it's uh, it's uh, enabling technologies for synthetic biology. Particularly, when our focus is will be on uh, microfluidics uh, and uh, biomicrosystems. So I will be the first speaker. Then afterwards, Professor Steve Craig from Stanford University and Dr. Irene Chen from Harvard University. So I'm going to get started. So my name is uh, Yimin Xin. I'm the professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Uh, and uh, so I just want to uh, show you some of the ideas we have on biomicrosystems. OK, we did. Uh, we spent some years to do point of care diagnostics, biomicrosystems, and not so much on bio, uh, synthetic biology. So to us, synthetic biology is very, very new. So we share with you some of the ideas we're thinking of how we can actually move from the biosystems that we're currently building to uh, synthetic biology areas. So uh, I guess some of you actually uh, probably went to Dr. Zhuendi's talk uh, yesterday that you uh, use as an energy between the IC industries at uh, that uh, now people can put millions of transistors on Intel microprocessors, but now you can only synthesize uh, 10 kilo base DNAs. So he projects that right now it's pretty much the 1980s on the IC industries. So by the time, 20 years from now, he expects that there will be very large expansions for synthetic biology industries. So what would be the next semiconductor or biotech industries? So I, I, I use base pairs versus bits. So bits is for the semiconductor industry and base pairs for, say, synthetic biology industries. So actually, what's the difference is? So let's just actually look at the common DNA technologies. Actually, if you look at the synthetic biologies, as some people think, it's actually just the common DNA technologies that people, the, the, uh, the two professors, one from Stanford, uh, Cohen and uh, Boyer from UCSF, that developed uh, the common DNA technology. So this is actually very similar to like synthetic biology. We have Juendi from Stanford. We have Chris Voigt <laughs> from UCSF. Okay, and they, they are actually very much the key drivers for the synthetic biology uh, conferences. On the other hand, the, uh, after the success of integrated circuits, the semiconductor industry, people think that maybe the next major applications will be MEMS area, microfluidics, microsystems, because of many of the manufacturing strategies, manufacturing, manufacturing techniques actually come from IC-based industries. But actually, uh, after but MEMS has been introduced, uh, probably two, at least two decades, two, three decades, but actually we don't really see a huge MEMS industries yet, right? Although the manufacturing skills, manufacturing uh, techniques are actually very similar to IC industries. Okay, so at the end, we probably think that uh, what drives the uh, IC industry to a huge success, we believe that is because of the materials or process standardizations, okay, and the uh, laws of physics that contribute to large scale success of semiconductor industries. Okay, that, that's the reason why in the early days, the golden mole can actually predict that every 18 months, the number of transistors in the microprocessors can double because the fundamental physics after uh, 1947's uh, tran discovery of transistors, all the rest is pretty much just miniaturizations. And that's uh, one of the reasons after 1958, after the Jack Kirby demonstrated the first integrated chips on the planar surfaces, then people can actually gradually pack more and more transistors on the chip because that pretty much physics, all the underlying physics are very much clear. Okay, but now the issue is, is do we have those similar conditions for synthetic biologies? Is it really true that everything we know about synthetic biology, how did you clone DNA, how did you put it into E. coli, how did you uh, introduce different genes, are those understandings are very much as mature as the IC industries? Or whether the process has been standardized, okay? What restriction enzyme you're going to use, what Plus, me, hot promoter, you're going to use whether those are standardized. Okay, and uh, so I more I put just put, put in my own two cents to uh, make the analogies between the differences of uh, uh, how one can actually build a bigger industries in biotech and try to emulate the success of ICs. Okay, so there have been many uh, examples of uh, 
people want to actually administrate uh, large scale systems to small systems. For example, on the biotech industries that people use, recombinant DNA technology, and it's how uh, them to make the recombinant DNA insulin uh, become a real success that we don't rely on the insulin from the pig sources. Now we rely on the insulin from the E. coli host. On the other hand, the, uh, the IC industries, the miniaturization technologies has provided uh, many possible applications for other industries. For, for example, chemical industries, previously you can build, uh, you have to build very large chemical plants. 20 years ago, people believed that you probably can build small reactors so that by the time if there's a chemical hazards, chemical incidents, the incidents, the actually the, uh, the safety, the incidents will be actually to be a small scale. In the chemical plant, if there's any accident, it will be like explosion. For micro reactors, the accident will be just like firecrackers, okay? So then you can simply just use these modularized micro reactors and build a large quantity like you put in the coffees, okay? You just having drop by drop coffees after a while, you see a very large scale coffee productions. However, to make, uh, to make the device small is easy, but for industry success, it's totally different stories. If you want to use synthetic biology for real applications, okay, one have to rely on the large quantities. Okay, this is uh, one of the uh, commercials uh, in uh, World War II that uh, World, the penicillin is uh, one of the most successful example why engineers and biologists have to work together. Okay, and that's if you look at the background information of our participants for synthetic biology 4.0. Many of them are biologists, scientists, and many of them are engineers, electrical engineers, and chemical engineers. But uh, why the, these two group of people have to work together? Because if you want to bring uh, a scientific discovery to a large success, then why have to worry about large scale uh, productions, right? That you cannot just produce a drugs in the flax, you have to produce it in large scale like fermenters. I guess these are the challenges uh, in the synthetic biology field that people have to face. Okay, you can use it as a tool. Then you can use synthetic biology as a tool for different applications. You can use it for genetics investigations. You can use it for, uh, for drug delivery, drug discovery, or other things. But if you want to use synthetic biology to create industries, then uh, there will be other things that people have to keep in mind. Similarly, like microfluidics, as I mentioned, people think that MEMS will create another industry, will have the similar scale of success, like IC industries. But that, in my view, did not happen. And now actually, microfluidics has become a very important tool for scientists, people in the biologists, in the chemists, or other engineers to use it as a tool to explore different uh, scientific uh, applications. I think uh, Professor Stephen Quay is the I guess the best person to talk, to comment on those. So I just um, steal some of the slides, and one of a couple of them are his actually. <laughs> that uh, over, over the past years, there have been many success. Okay, many uh, very impressive demonstrations of uh, microfluidics and on chips, and uh, this success actually has stimulated the applications in different areas. Like this is Professor George White's high school. We can use large scale meters. And uh, uh, Professor Craig's group has demonstrated this uh, like uh, medium scale, large scale integrations of microfluidic uh, network. And uh, people can use microfluidic uh, devices to look at subcellular as well as submolecular uh, integrations. And this is a very impressive example that demonstrated by uh, scientists in Tokyo's group where they can use uh, very small uh, low terry motor ATP, F1, ATPase, and they actually then uh, attach uh, one of the unit to the magnetic uh, particles, they use magnetic tweezers to turn the ATPs to demonstrate that you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, produce ATP by, uh, if you turn it counterclockwise, you actually hydrolyze the ATP, you turn it clockwise, actually produce the ATP, and they can actually visualize these operations uh, using um, microfluidic base or MEMS base uh, platforms. And people also have demonstrated that you can use microfluidic platforms to look at 
and bionic cells development. And this, these tools actually show you that you can use microfluidic platforms. You might be able to use microfluidic platform to look at other engineer microorganisms. For example, you put different genes into a microorganism and you want to understand the different functions. And maybe uh, microfluidic platform is one of the uh, uh, very useful technology to, to do it. Other examples is that uh, microfluidic space uh, systems can, o can also have been uh, developed for point of care or other cell-based type of analysis. So back in Hong Kong, um, I come to Hong Kong 11 years ago, then I asked myself what are the areas that uh, the microreactors uh, can contribute to the community of Hong Kong. Then, uh, so at that time, we decided to work on two things. One is to look at something, uh, want to use the uh, uh, microchip for the traditional Chinese medicine standardization. The other, we want to use a microsystem for point of care applications, which we believe that these are the two applications that are very relevant to the local uh, community. So let me first to introduce this uh, gene chip for traditional Chinese medicines. For those of you who have some Chinese background, either through your parents, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, or your students, you might have known that actually Chinese medicine are very good. Okay, At least for Chinese people believe they are very good. Because there's the resident of ancestors. Okay, if you got a cold, you got a flu, you got a fever, you just go to the traditional Chinese medicine doctor. They give you something that you don't understand. They put everything together, ask you to go home to boil them, then make the soup become black. After that, then you just drink them. And next day, miracle happened. Disease is gone. Okay? And you never try to understand what did you drink, what did you eat. You don't care whether it's poisonous meal or anything. You just, you just drink it. But anyway, then miracle happens. Then the disease is gone, right? But then, uh, because we don't quite understand traditional Chinese medicine, we just believe our parents, believe our ancestors. So it would be very difficult to use this platform to sell it to uh, Western countries, right? Because Western countries, they have very much standardized procedures to, uh, to, edu to certify different uh, drug-related uh, products. And this is an example, right? This is something in Chinese we call Chuanbei. Chuanbei is, uh, is a bay from Sichuan, okay? It's some, sort of, it's, it's, it's some sort of beans from Sichuan. But if you buy this kind of uh, things from Zhejiang, we call Zhebei, from Zhejiang province. But the, the Zhejiang province uh, beads and the Sichuan province beads, they look very similar, okay? You cannot tell the differences, but they look very similar, but their therapeutic efficiencies are very, very different. Okay, so you have to find other ways to, uh, to standardize the product, okay, because they look very similar, so the consumers can be easily tricked, okay. So uh, this just uh, gives you some review of what traditional med Chinese medicine are, some from the roots, some from the flowers, and some flowers actually can be toxic, okay, but the toxic flowers, but if you put many toxic flowers together, they become non-toxic, okay? But this is very difficult to, to explain, okay? That's one of the reasons why uh, Professor Jack Kisling mentioned one of the success examples that he can use on the mini thing for the anti-malaria drugs, but that's a single component drug. But it will be very difficult to use the same platforms to explore multi-component drug in traditional Chinese medicines, okay? So you have toxic fruits, and you have toxic flowers, and sometimes you have toxic bugs, okay? And all together, and these are all actually different recipes, and uh, then and, uh, in all the ancestors, they have different kind of uh, recipe Bible tell you in different conditions what you, need to, what you need to do. So what we did is that we tried to use uh, molecular biology or uh, DNA microchip to find a way to standardize the traditional medicine. And our way is to actually look at specific regions in the 5S RNA space domain. They, we found that, actually not I found that, I, our collaborators in the biology department found that the, uh, in these regions, they have actually, uh, in the tendon repeating units, which they have 120 base pairs, very highly conserved, but they have a 300 to 600 base space region are actually very much different. Like a difference can be a couple base pairs or single base pairs. And we can use the information here to differentiate traditional Chinese medicines, okay? 
that for example, that Chinese Chinese medicine, the same species grown in different soil, and because of secondary metabolites, and they will actually trigger the mutations of this region. So therefore, by recognizing the difference in these spatial regions, you can, you can actually, this could be a good way to effectively standardize the traditional Chinese medicine. So what we did is then the rest is actually very simple. We use our UST fabrication facilities. Then we do a silicon-based uh, service. We, we put oligo uh, probes immobilized on, the, uh, on this uh, patent silicon wafer surfaces. Then we do a wafer-based uh, uh, fabrication process. This is a four-inch wafer. Then we can make a four uh, PCR micro reactors on the, each die. Then we have actually 16 die for each wafers. Then you can actually, then each of the device will be ready for uh, PCR reaction. This is the best side, which, which we have uh, three microliter to 20 microliter uh, micro PCR reactors for each die. Then the front side, you can see actually platinum based heater and sensor to control the temperature for the PCR reactions. Okay, and they actually, this particular reactor, not just for the PCR reactions, it also will use the same spot for uh, fluorescence based detection or for electrochemical based detections on the same spot. So first we actually have to get the powders, then we get the graduate student to grind the powders, to be the grind the leaf flower to become powders, then we check the genomic DNA, and after that we use these devices to do DNA amplifications, then we do the sequence specific detections, and we use this uh, on chip heater and sensor to control the melting temperatures and the uh, uh, kneeling and the extension temperatures. Then, because I, I mentioned earlier, we use asymmetric PCR, then we use on the reverse primer side, we can attach the CY3, CI, CI5, or test ray. Then, after that, you can actually directly on the same spot do the uh, uh, fluorescent space uh, detections. And we use these techniques, we, we, we actually to uh, try about 20 different uh, TCM uh, species. So this is the first example that I mentioned for uh, using microchip for uh, applications that have some local relevance. And the second example that I want to talk about is uh, for payload care diagnosis. Okay, Hong Kong, uh, as our financial secretary mentioned on Monday, Hong Kong has very low fertility. That means people don't want to deliver babies here. Okay, because of, it's very expensive to raise a kid in Hong Kong. But Hong Kong people has very long life expectancies. Okay? Probably something to do with the tea, the dim sum you drink. And tea and dim sum, they are immiscible. So tea will help you to digest the oily stuff away faster. And they have some traditional Chinese medicine effect to it. So somehow people in Hong Kong, unbelievable, can live longer. Okay? But people live longer. I mean, in one thing, it's a good thing. On the other hand, it put a lot of burden to the society, right? In the sense that you will have to have a very good Medicare system to take care of all people. So one of the possibilities to think of the point of care diagnosis. Another thing is that, I mean, this was, uh, I don't think it's going to happen in Hong Kong, but anyway. But uh, we all know the uh, MTR station in Hong Kong is typically very, very crowded. And this is pretty much after midnight. For, for example, some of the people up to the karaoke yesterday. If you went to the subway, this is pretty much what you seen yesterday. But anyway, so another is that a full quality controls that Hong Kong has actually is very famous not for science and technology. I hope it will be famous for science and technology. But currently it's famous for food and shopping and racing. Okay, horse racing, food, shopping, these are the three things you have, you must do before you leave this conference. Okay. And uh, so we think the uh, Quality of food is very important. So we want to find a way that you can actually do a very portable, very quick monitoring of the food safety, whether there are any pathogens involved in the, uh, in the food. And also, Hong Kong is a very small place, so the water is also very, very important to us. It's not just for us, it's also for our kids. So we want to develop, de develop a device okay, for point of care testing applications. But what is point of care testing? And there's actually very rigorous defined definitions. Okay, it's so an analytical testing performed outside the central lab using a device that can easily transport it to the vicinity of the patients. The uh, POCT will be useful, for example, there are some tests require immediate 
resolve to begin treatment or life-threatening conditions or tests that are required to initiate treatment immediately and the tests they are required to make sure that the bacteria don't the drug you use does not have a, uh, for, do not have a resisting resistance kind of a, they are antibiotics uh, does not show this kind of uh, resistance effects all the tests can be done in a remote location and this is very useful for food or water monitoring but there are not too many successful examples one of the successful examples commercially is the blood glucose sensors so we want to think about the way whether we can actually develop the point of care molecular diagnostic system using uh, nuclear s based testing as uh, one of the future possible commercially success of POCD systems. But if you look at FDA's definitions, actually it's not easy to qualify to be a poil care testing device because it requires very simple operations, okay? That uh, the system has to be fully automatic. It has to contact in direct or unprocessed specimen and they require no operators intervention during the uh, analysis. And all you need to do is to change the battery. Okay, to use the device. So actually, it's technically very challenging. Okay, to uh, actually to certify a device that can be labeled as a POCT uh, device. So there, so they, in a sense, there are a lot of research to be done. So this is uh, one of the uh, integrated mild and nickel micro device that we have envi envisaged for the past many years. Assuming the human got sick or the chicken got sick, human and chicken are equally important in Hong Kong. Because so Chinese people like to eat chickens. So you need to make sure they are sufficient supply of live chickens, okay? But the chicken are live, so they could carry viruses, okay? If the chicken carry viruses that we don't know, they only seem, although they are important, but we, we had to sacrifice all those virus carry chickens. But uh, when I joined the university in 1997, the year after the Hong Kong government killed millions of chickens because of H5N1 viruses. So we think that it will be actually quite important to make sure we have actually a device that can rapidly detect the virus or others, okay? So these devices can detect the uh, body fluid, and after that you have, you have uh, ways to untreat, take away the genomic DNA. After that you can do these uh, untreat PCR reactions, they amplify the, uh, the DNA to the, uh, to the amount that you want to have, but typically, this is how it was done, right? Then you do the DNA, you do a fluorescence-based detection. But fluorescence-based detection is very difficult to be miniaturized. So we spend a lot of effort trying to do this electrochemistry-based detection so the device can be portable. Also, this electrochemical signals is actually portable. So this is uh, actually uh, a device we built. This device is actually, you have a front side of uh, heaters, back side you have reservoir for reactors, and you have uh, Indian tin oxide patent devices. Then this you have a full in Indian tin oxide patent pad here for uh, different DNA mobilization, where allow it allow us to do the multiplex uh, detections. Then we assemble it through so bonding processes, and this is where you put in the different magnetic particles and others, PCR mix, and do the on-chip DNA amplifications and electrochemical chemical uh, detections. Let me just go through the process here. You take the E. coli as a crude sample. You put it to the chip, then we have magnetic particle, uh, and then you are uh, using on chip heater and sensor to break the E. coli. After that, you put the uh, biotin link probe, and this uh, probe will actually complementary to certain region of genome DNA. Then after that, the probe will link up to the sotabidin bind to the magnetic particles. So we use this process to purify the genome on the chip. And after that, we do that uh, the genome will be released to the solution phase. And after that, you can do uh, solution phase PCR, and after this solution phase PCR, these PCR input counts will be hybridized to the surface, then we do a silver and gold enhancement, then we, then we detect the silver dissolution current. So this process will achieve this uh, crude sample in and E signal out, that we take in the crude sample to the chip, what do we get at the end? It will be just a electrochemical a signal out. Oh, and this is, this is the standard uh, standard curve tell you how much how many cells we can handle. So the rest of three minutes, I want to mention to you another part, another project that we are doing is that we want to change these uh, traditional real time PCR machines. Typically, the, the traditional PCR machine is actually done by using cyber grain 
or uh, Kamen probes, where that the, uh, under the uh, with the increase of TCR cycles, you see the accumulations of fluorescent signals. The real time PCR is good because it allows us to do quantitative precise analysis and wide dynamic ranges. Okay, but uh, it involves very expensive machine. The real time PCR machine costs about three hundred Hong Kong dollars. But the endpoint PCR machine just costs 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. It's more than one order make two differences. So we want to find a way to do electrochemistry based PCR. Okay, and the advantages will be it's amenable to point of care testing applications, require less sophisticated instrumentation, and highly sensitive. Okay, but challenges is we have to find a way to electrochemically to accumulate the uh, signals uh, as the thermal cycle PCR increases, and so on and so forth. But this electrochemical uh, active probe have been demonstrated previously, for example, fatal things that uh, plus, uh, the UC Santa Barbara's groups use, uh, say, a molecular beacon, then you have a fatal thing very close to the uh, probe surfaces, you have complementary DNA, then after that, the double chain DNA structures become more frigid and move away the fatal thing from the surfaces. So then you can tell the, the electrochemical signal differences. So here we actually establish a chemical real type PCR platform using the solid phase uh, extension and both solution phase extension. And the process require uh, uh, Indian tin oxide based uh, electro. Then during the PCR process, in addition to the solution phase PCR, on the surface, the, uh, the hybridization uh, bound probe will also be extended because of solid phase extension. And uh, the number of uh, electroactive labels, like for example, fatal thing will be accumulated to the surface. And by doing so, we are able to actually achieve cycle by cycle increase through the, uh, through the, the process. Okay, this is showing you the examples that our uh, electrochemical real time PCR can do very well for large template concentrations. However, in the smaller template concentrations, ours is still not as good as the fluorescence PCR, so there's still a lot of work to be done. So we believe the microfluidics and micro biomicrosystems will be an enabling technology for synthetic biology in the following reasons. For large-scale integration, for platform for interfacing and probing between the natural and uh, artificial environments, a platform high, high super screening and synthetic biospecies, a platform for rapid on-demand cost-effective DNA synthesis and sequencing. These are the examples that Professor Craig is going to talk about, what his group has been doing on the synthetic biology area. And uh, this is also uh, Professor Rich Macy's group also demonstrated that on chip you can do a Sanger-based DNA sequencing. And we have uh, uh, participants in this conference, uh, Dr. Uh, Peter Carr, David Kong's group from MIT demonstrated that can do uh, uh, actually very large scale gene syn uh, synthesis using very small 500 nanoliter uh, reactions. And these are actually uh, very successful examples that have linked the uh, synthetic biology and microfluidic devices. I believe these are just the early examples. There will be more examples uh, to, to be demonstrated that the microfluidics and microsystems can play a very important role to the new field of synthetic biology. With that, I want to thank the, uh, the funding agencies and uh, the students who participate in this work. Some of the students are not my students anymore. These are the picture taken five years ago. And some of the students already have babies. And some of the students have become professors. So this, uh, I would also like to thank the collaborators, Professor Nancy Yip, for the Jinchi project for TCN, and uh, some of the students and postdocs involved in this project. Thank you very much. Because of time, we can only entertain one question, or no questions. Do you have any questions? Sorry, what's the lower limited detection in the integrated PCR devices in terms of the number of molecules? Okay. Um, for the um, for the uh, for the for the E. coli in electrochemical signal out examples, and uh, the lowest one we try is 100, 100 cells uh, per microliter in that particular examples.
Yeah, because we did not use uh, number of molecules to uh, to quantify the detection limit because uh, we involved the uh, PCR process. And the PCR process typically we use 30 cycles, very much like the standard PCR processes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>